achieve in this session with the use of uh, a couple of case studies is to look at some of the more advanced retirement planning options in truth, uh, as well as the mechanics behind uh, the lifetime allowance and annual allowance calculations, which truth applies to your client's cash flow uh, and how these are influenced by the different changes that you can make uh, within your models. Uh, in the first case study, we're going to take a brief look at the pension benefit options. Uh, we'll look at the impact of the different benefit options you can choose on your client's lifetime allowance position. We'll look at uh, lifetime allowance protection and how to model this. We'll also look at the different ways of including pension wealth in the cash flow. In the second case study, we'll be looking at annual allowance. So how pension contributions are shown in the pension statement, how to model hypothetical changes to policies, uh, as well as how to create a simple what if scenario. Uh, and then we're finally going to look at some of the cash flow tools uh, and the impact of uh, increased pension funding. So this is, uh, as I say, this is Michael's old occupational pension. Uh, it's got a fund value of about £700,000. Uh, Michael not interested in you know, potentially moving to a different provider who could offer a fantastic growth rate. Uh, and again, uh, just to give us a nice transparent illustration of the difference between our scenarios, uh, I'm keeping the growth rate the same in, uh, in all of the hypothetical pensions that we're going to be looking at here. So the first thing we're going to do is set up some benefits in this pension. Um, and again, everyone able to see the benefits window here? Lovely, perfect. Um, so uh, we'll take a very, very quick look at the benefit options within pensions, because this is the main thing that's going to have an impact on how the client's lifetime allowance is going to be used up. Um, the first thing that we need to do in all cases is specify a date on which benefits will be taken. In this case, I've got a key date set up for retirement, but this could equally be any age, 55, 70, whatever it might be, or any calendar date in the box on the left hand side. There's three different benefit types in truth. Um, those are lump sum, which is any uh, use of the uh, the UF plus legislation that came in and pension freedom. So this is this could be taking uh, you know ten thousand pounds out of the pension fund to put a conservatory on the house, or it could be taking five thousand pounds or five percent a year, or it could be taking the entirety of the pension fund as a lump sum. Annuity, which is the option we're going to be looking at in this case, again, fairly self-explanatory, up to 25% of however much you take as tax-free cash, and then the remainder uh, purchase an annuity. Um, and then drawdown, uh, slightly more flexible option. Obviously, the fund remains invested, but again, take any amount, uh, take up to 25% tax-free cash, and then specify an income at some point in future. And we'll take a closer look at that in just a moment. Uh, but in this case, the client was annuitizing. And again, we can specify as much as we like or as little as we like of the fund being used to purchase an annuity. So we could say that £100,000 worth of the pension fund at retirement will be used to purchase an annuity, or we can enter a percentage-based annuity purchase. So again, this could be a hybrid arrangement. The client could opt to take 50% of the fund to purchase an annuity and 50% to buy a drawdown contract. But in this case, 100% was used to purchase an annuity and they took their 25% tax-free cash. They planned on taking their 25% tax-free cash. Um, it's worth noting at this point, so uh, we've got a calculated annuity rate here of 38.6%. So this is based on the uh, Connor to Business Sourcebook standard deterministic projection for a future annuity, which is just as exciting as it sounds. Um, but the key thing to note is that if you vary any of these assumptions, we will uh, recalculate the annuity rate for you. So this is a level annuity if they wanted some escalation. It dropped down to £23.8 per thousand. If they wanted a, a widow's pension of 66.6%, it drops down to £20.7 per thousand. So again, sorry, uh, kind of missed that point slightly. This is pounds per thousand rather than percent. So um, that equates obviously to 10 times the percent equivalent. That's 2.07%. Um, if we do have uh, a projection from a provider and we wanted to override that calculated figure, you know, if we wanted to say that we've got a 4% uh, projection from the Prudential, uh, we can just type in our own annuity rate there. Um, but if I just save that, what we'll see is a summary here on the crystallizations tab down at the bottom. So the pension fund's going to be worth about £1.2 million at retirement, obviously £300,000 being taken there as tax cash and the rest being used to purchase an annuity. 
So the first thing to point out from this client's perspective is uh, what happens when we look at the net worth. So uh, the net worth is probably one of the most transparent illustrations of the difference between annuity and drawdown. And all of this stuff on the left will stay exactly the same in the different scenarios. We're not changing anything uh, or sound issues. A couple of you have no sound there. Can, can most of you hear me? Apologies. If you've got no sound, try leaving the uh, try leaving the meeting and, and coming back in. Um, there, there will be a recording shared afterwards. So if you do have technical issues, hopefully uh, you know it's not affecting too many of you. Uh, you should be able to jump out and jump back into the meeting, and, and audio should be fine. If not, then you know feel free to to, to leave, and we'll email you the recording after the session. Uh, apologies if, if anyone's having any issues. Um, so the, the clearest place to look at the, the differences for this client is, is, is on that lifelong chart. So to look at the lifelong chart uh, on its own, uh, we can click on lifelong chart here at the top. And what you'll see here is uh, when the client hits retirement, so at this point it's age 60, the pension fund disappears. So two things are happening here. The first is that we're releasing the PCLS of the tax-free cash. Um, so we get a big jump in, in cash down at the bottom. They're actually also selling their business at that point, uh, their private company. Uh, hence it jumping up by more than a, a quarter of the value of the pension fund. The other thing to note is that the rest of the pension disappears. So it's being used to purchase an annuity contract. Uh, the client has no further access to the pension fund. It's gone. Um, when we look at the cash flow, what we'll see is, is, is a very similar picture. So if we jump to the cash flow for this client, the first thing to note is that it's actually pretty good. Uh, so I'm just going to play around with some annotations here. Uh, so hopefully we can see we've got a big injection of capital here uh, at retirement. Uh, we can also see here uh, that uh, we've got a period of rapid decumulation in early retirement and then a period of slightly slower decumulation in later retirement. So uh, excellent, Graham. Uh, sound. Fantastic. Um, I'll try and keep an eye on, on, on the chat if I can. Uh, so we've got yet yeah, two periods of retirement here. So the client's spending more heavily through to about age 75. Uh, and then uh, their spending is, is reined right in in later retirement. So we can see there that actually their cash flow looks pretty good. But this wasn't allowing them to achieve the, the primary goal. So, you know, this is facilitating all of that retirement spending, everything they wanted to do. Uh, you know, the cash flow looks nice and healthy, but they weren't ring fencing any pension wealth. You know, there's no additional pension wealth in the background here um, for them to access. Um, what they wanted to do Don't want to be drawing arrows. Apologies. Turn drawing off. Uh, what they wanted to be able to do is to be able to ring fence as much of the pension wealth as possible. So uh, with this being a retirement planning webinar, obviously, we will be looking at the pension statement a couple of times today. If I jump through to the pension statement, what we can see is uh, how the client's um, annual allowance position looks, how their pension funds look over time. Uh, so there's various different uh, statements, various different charts uh, in the pension statement here. I won't spend too much time going through this. We do have an excellent video on our YouTube channel that walks through each of these different charts and statements. Um, the one that we're most interested in for this client is the third chart down at the bottom here, the crystallizations chart. Now, there'll normally be a line on this chart, um, but you can only draw a line between two points. And for this client, everything happens in one lump sum at retirement. So as we saw, uh, the pension fund going to be worth uh, about 1.2 million pounds. Uh, yes, Paul, um, there's going to be a recording shared after the session. Uh, so we'll share a recording of, of the full session. You'll be able to enjoy uh, me struggling with screen sharing and, and everything in, in full HD. Um, so yeah, everything happening in one lump sum for this client. So we've got about 1.2 million pounds here, um, all being crystallized as one lump sum. And they're using 91% of the projected lifetime allowance at that point. We can actually look at the numbers behind the scenes here by looking at the crystallizations tab at the top. Uh, and we can see that actually 22% of the LTA uh, usage is, is, is the, uh, the PCLS, the lump sum, uh, and 68% uh, is the purchase of the annuity. So taking us up to 91% of the lifetime allowance being used um, in, in this scenario. But that's not what they wanted to do. So they wanted to look at the possibility of uh, going into drawdown, so transferring the pension fund into drawdown. So again, same fund value, uh, same growth rate within the pension, uh, but we're going to look at some different benefit options for the client. 
So one of the pitfalls that we often find people falling into when they're looking at transferring into Drawdown um, is uh, trying to mimic the benefits of um, of the, the seeding scheme. So uh, you know, here we're looking at transferring uh, out of uh, an annuity into a pension fund that can uh, offer drawdown. Um, so we can just look at you know, how much income can the pension sustain or can it match the uh, the income from the drawdown uh, from the uh, from the annuity. So I've just clicked on the uh, sustainable income calculator, this recycling symbol here next to our proposed income. Um, and this is telling me that uh, you know, I can specify the parameters for uh, the pension. So I can say, you know, when do I want income to start? How long do I want this to last? So I could say, you know, this could just bridge income up to state pension, for example, or they might have a DD pension that pays in at 65. You know, how much could this fund uh, sustain from 60 to 65? But in this case, I'm going to just ask the software to calculate for me how much income uh, this pension fund can sustain all the way from 60 to age 100 with a little bit of escalation each month. And it's just over £2,500. I'm also going to tick this uh, update sustainable income tick box here. Now to do exactly the same thing, I could have just ticked this option here. It would have taken me straight to the same figure. I uh, just wanted to show you some of the options there behind the scenes. Uh, the advantage of the auto update option here, and we'll see this when we look at the second case study today, is that as you adjust things like contributions or fund values within a pension or growth rates, we'll automatically recalculate what that sustainable income figure will be for this client. And I'm just going to click on save here. And we can see again, these numbers are exactly the same. So we've still got 1.2 million pounds. We've still got 300,000 pounds worth of tax-free cash, but the situation looks very different when we start to look at the different planning statements for the client. So when we look at the client's net worth, uh, if you remember with the annuity uh, scenario a moment ago, the fund value disappeared at age 60. So again, just jumping onto that lifelong chart, what we can see here is that at this point, everything else stays the same. So we've still got the same injection of, of uh, PCLS and the sale of the business. But at this point, the pension fund is still there. And you can see the impact of that sustainable income calculation there. Uh, the software is uh, nicely kind of depleting the value of the pension fund through to age 100. Uh, and we'll recalculate based on any changes that we make to the value of the pension fund. So we've still got pension fund uh, available there all the way through. Uh, if we jump to the cash flow now, what we'll see is uh, we'll see the impact of uh, the transfer. And you you could be forgiven for thinking this is exactly the same cash flow. It looks it looks pretty healthy again. It looks very, very similar. Now, obviously, what we can do is we can use the overlay chart tool down in the bottom corner here to compare drawdown and annuity. And we can see straight away that actually drawdown is slightly better off. Uh, there's a couple of reasons behind this. Again, you know, we're not being overly optimistic with with fund growth right here, but the annuity rates that uh, are currently being offered are pretty terrible. Uh, we did uh, opt for a 4% annuity versus the you know, 2% that uh, the software was calculating, but still draw down a marginally better option for the client. But bear in that the client's main aim here wasn't having a, you know, a really healthy cash flow, uh, regardless of how much pension was behind the scenes it's actually ring fencing as much of that pension wealth as possible without having to compromise on, on their lifestyle um, while, uh, you know, while, while, while still being able to do everything that they wanted to do with, with the rest of their life. So um, if we jump back to the pension statement, again, just showing exactly the same charts for, for each of the two um, scenarios here, uh, what we'll see is the main difference is down in this third chart here. So we're up to 98% of the projected lifetime allowance now being used. And we do have two points on the chart, so we can now draw lines. So uh, the first LTA tests are at age 60, and these are exactly the same. So still 1.2 million being crystallized. What we also have here, though, is a further LTA test at age 75, when uh, the remaining pension fund uh, is, is tested against, so the growth on the pension fund is tested against the lifetime allowance. Um, and there's 157,000 pounds of the pension wealth being tested against the LTA at that point. And we can see it takes them right up to the lifetime allowance threshold. So 98.38% of the LTA used, almost as if I'd set this up so they're just below the LTA. Um, so that again, you know, this, this, this wasn't their main goal. Their main goal was to ring fence as much of the pension wealth as possible. So what I've actually done is I've set up a third scenario called drawdown less income. Uh, and again, we've now got a copy of the pension where they're taking a lower level of income. And if I just have a look again 
at the benefits tab on what we've done here, uh, all identical, but rather than take a sustainable rate of income, and if you remember from a couple of minutes ago, it's about £2,500 a month, we're actually taking a much lower figure of £1,000 a month. And I've worked this out by looking at the expenditure statement for the client and looking at how much income they actually need to take. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, this is in actual terms. So when we look at the income statement in a moment, you'll see that this is adjusted for inflation over the next few years. So taking a much lower level of income, you know, how does that impact on their cash flow? Well, actually, this client, uh, the first red that we'll see on the cash flow chart, um, it actually results in them running out of money at about age 94 or 95. Now, uh, this client in reality was fine with that. And I'm sure most of you will have come across clients in this situation, uh, not overly optimistic about their life expectancy. Surviving to uh, you know, 85 would be a great out outcome for them. So you know, clients who are insistent that all of their parents had passed away by by the time they reached 80, they weren't going to make it much longer themselves. Uh, if they were still around in their 90s, then that's a bonus. But it's worth noting that this is just looking at their liquidity. So at the point at which they reach age 95, they've still got money tied up in uh, their property. They've still got money tied up in their pensions. So we can obviously look at injecting further capital into the cash flow at that point. It's not just the pensions as well. Uh, you know, we can look at releasing money from the property. So that could be equity release. It could be a lifetime mortgage. It could be downsizing. And what I've done here is I've actually set up uh, a downsize uh, as a key date. And this is just the sale of their main residence and the purchase of a smaller property, releasing about £200,000 worth of equity. So, you know, again, we can introduce that into the cash flow. That is an option there for them uh, if they were to survive uh, into their uh, mid to late 90s. Uh, there is still you know, wealth available for them. Uh, it's not like they've you know, completely run out of money. But the main difference uh, in this client's case uh, was, was the pension statement. So if we have a look at the pension statement for this client, what we'll see, you know, again, jumping straight down to that third chart, we're not overly interested in this case in their annual allowance usage or in their fund values. Uh, jumping down to that third chart, what we'll see is that they're now exceeding the lifetime allowance. And obviously that first event is still exactly the same, 1.204 million. But then that final test, so the growth on the pension fund that's tested against the lifetime allowance at age 75 actually shows them exceeding the lifetime allowance. Um, so 136% of the projected lifetime allowance being used. And again, we can jump to the crystallization statement, take a closer look at what's going on there. And we can see that at this point, um, we've got £900,000 worth of pension wealth that's tested against the lifetime allowance at age 75. And that results in £180,000 of the lifetime allowance charges for the client. But they're ring fencing that pension wealth. And actually, if we have a look at how that compares from an income tax perspective, when they're taking that lower level of income, and I'm just going to jump here to the first year of retirement. When they're taking that lower level of income, uh, they're actually paying a marginal amount of income tax. So next to no income tax in this scenario, in this drawdown, less income scenario. If we look at the same statement for the same year in the standard drawdown scenario, so where we're taking the maximum amount of sustainable income, uh, what we see is they're actually paying about £4,000 worth of tax each year. So £4,000 worth of tax each year from age 60 to age 100 over that kind of 40 year period, we're looking at 160,000 pounds income tax saving versus 180,000 pounds worth of lifetime allowance charge. But obviously there's one key thing that we need to bear in mind there, which is that when we're looking at their net worth in this scenario, and we're looking at how that position looks at age 94 when they run out of money, uh, we've still got about 1.4 million pounds of the pension wealth that we've managed to pre preserve for them. And obviously we can look at that on the cash flow as well. So when we reach age 94, 95, um, we can use the overlay chart tool down here at the bottom to overlay pensions as if they were readily realizable. So the pensions aren't readily realizable. There's going to be tax implications to drawing from them. But what we can see here is that 1.4 million pounds of the pension wealth still there in the background. So if they were to survive to, you know, age, age 94, 95, and they needed access to that capital, it's capital that's going to be available there for them. It's not capital that's, you know, kind of beyond their reach. So they're, they're not compromising on any of those lifestyle goals here, but we're managing to preserve all of that pension wealth for them. Uh, and, you know, they're still fine through to about age 95. They still have the option of downsizing uh, or 
whatever they might need to do at that point. Um, I did want to show you one last thing uh, in this case study before we move on, uh, which is the lifetime allowance protection option here at the top. Uh, if we click on this, it will take us straight through to the client's personal details on the fact find and allow us to specify that they had fixed protection, primary enhanced protection. So if we have FP12, for example, um, if I save that, what we'll see is that that will uh, fix their uh, lifetime allowance to 1.8 million until such point as the standard lifetime allowance exceeds that. Uh, so the applicable LTA will change to 1.8 million until the standard lifetime allowance. We can see the indexation on the standard lifetime allowance uh, at this point going up to, to 2 million pounds. Uh, bear with me one second. Excellent question, Angela. We will actually come back to that. We'll come back to that at the end because it's uh, it, it's a great it's a great option to look at. Um, but that, in effect, is 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 that first case study. So, uh, and, and the kind of main thing to bear in mind there is that their cash flow was worse uh, after we'd uh, we'd helped them. So, you know, cash flow isn't necessarily the be all uh, and end all. Uh, and actually, having a better cash flow in in some cases uh, actually results in in the client being worse off. Uh, and you know, it, it obviously comes down to to the client's needs, the client's uh, aspirations, the client's goals. Um, so this is Mike and Kate. And Mike and Kate are business owners. Um, they had a very, very clear idea of what they wanted their retirement to look like. So this case was entirely driven by their expenditure goals and the stuff they said they wanted to do uh, with the rest of their lives. So they've got a mortgage, it's paid off uh, in a couple of years time. You can see that disappearing. Uh, they've got a lot of money that they're spending on the kids. So they've got private school fees at the moment. They've got weddings they want to pay for, for their daughter, for their son uh, in retirement. They're currently running company cars, um, but they're going to run private cars in retirement. They're going to replace them every five years. They're going to stop replacing the cars at 75. They know exactly what they want to do. Um, their personal expenditures, so things like holidays and, and, uh, and travel, uh, are going to jump up uh, at retirement at age 60. They're going to go down a little bit at 75, down a little bit more at age 80. Um, their core expenditure, the household stuff down at the bottom here, is staying the same throughout. So they had a very, very clear idea of what they wanted to spend. The problem was that they couldn't afford it. So we have a look at their cash flow. What we'll see is that it very quickly runs out of money in retirement. So again, you know, we've got some money coming in at retirement, uh, but then it doesn't last them anywhere near as long as uh, it needed to do. So fundamentally, there's only three ways to fix a broken cash flow. Uh, the first one is to increase investment returns. Now, for this client, they weren't prepared to look at increasing investment returns. Uh, they were being very cautious, actually, with uh, the growth rates that we were assuming for them. Um, and they weren't prepared to look at that. But obviously, if we wanted to do so, uh, we could look at uh, the growth calculator. So calculating a, a rate of return that's required to achieve a certain cash flow. Or we could look at the growth rate step and step growth rates up or down by a certain percentage at a time. So those options are available there to us if that's an option the client wanted to look at. But in this case, they weren't prepared to do so. Uh, the growth rates that we were assuming uh, within the various items were the growth rates that we were going to use. The second option for a broken cash flow is to reduce expenditure. And again, we've got the spend less calculator here, which allows us to specify that over a certain period of time, for example, or for the rest of the client's lives or from 75 to 100, for example, uh, we wanted to reduce expenditure each year or each month. Uh, if we wanted to invest that money rather than spend it, how much would we need to invest it at? You know, over what period? Uh, but again, this client had very, very clear ideas about what they wanted to spend in retirement. So reducing expenditure wasn't an option, which left us only with the third option. So the third option is increasing income. Uh, now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, these clients were company owners, so we could have looked at increasing salary. We could have looked at increasing dividends. But actually what we opted to look for for this client was maximizing pension contributions. So they weren't making anywhere near as much in terms of pension contributions as um, as, as they could have been. Uh, but obviously those options also available there to us. Before we look at uh, the output from that calculator, what I would like to do very briefly is have a look at the mechanics behind uh, annual allowance calculations in the software. So it's important to understand how the annual allowance calculations work and how carry forward works in the software um, before we look at, at how we kind of solved this case. Um, so the way I'm going to demonstrate that is by taking Michael's salary 
away from him. So Michael's currently got a salary of £80,000. I'm just going to get that to zero for a moment. Um, he's also making pension contributions. He's not making very large pension contributions. If we have a look at his, uh, oh, that's his old mutual bond. Uh, if we have a look at his personal pension, uh, what we'll see is that he's currently making pension contributions of £200 a month. Now, without salary, obviously the maximum contributions uh, that he could be making are £3,600 a year uh, or £300 a month. If I set this to £301 a month, having removed his salary, what we should hopefully see is some pension warnings appear. Lovely. There we go. So there's two different warnings that have popped up here. The first uh, is uh, this notification on, on in the bottom right. This is called a toast notification. Uh, so these will pop out when certain things happen within the software. Uh, in this case, um, this will pop out when we uh, first exceed the annual allowance or lifetime allowance. It'll also pop out when you when you open up a client. Um, we've also got these notifications up at the top. So these are badge notifications and these will stay there all the time. Um, so we've got two notifications here and that's because the pension actually appears in both our scenarios. So Mike's exceeding the annual allowance in both the current position and his additional contributions scenario. And if we click on this notification, it's going to take us straight through to the annual allowance statement and show us where that, uh, that, that, that excess happens. Uh, David, I'll, I'll jump onto that at the end of the uh, at the end of the webinar. So just bear with me. Um, so we can see here, uh, Michael's contributing three thousand six hundred and twelve pounds a year, which is obviously exceeding by twelve pounds. If I jump back to the fact find, uh, and uh, let's just inject some common sense into the proceedings. If I just give him a salary of eighty thousand pounds back, what we should hopefully see is those notifications will disappear at the top of the screen, which they do. And if we jump back to the annual allowance statement, we'll now see that he's got additional contributions that he could be making up to the annual allowance each year and his carry forwards, uh, carry forwards appearing as normal. We also have the other end of the spectrum. So obviously, if we now uh, increase his salary, let's just triple his salary for him up to 240,000. What we'll hopefully see is some tapering going on. Lovely, we do. Um, so uh, again, we can show the adjusted and threshold income behind the scenes. And if we look at the current tax year, we can see there that his adjusted income is 253,000. His threshold income is 249,000. His maximum additional personal contribution he can make is 32,000. But we can see here the annual allowance figure being tapered each year going forwards uh, based, on, based on his earnings. But he doesn't have a salary of 240,000. I'm just going to pop this back to 80,000. The key thing to note here is that um, Michael could be making, Mike could be making some, some additional contributions this year. Uh, so 2020-21, uh, uh, the uh, maximum additional contribution he could make personally is 76,000. Uh, maximum additional contributions that an employer could make on his behalf, 145,000 pounds. So those are the figures that we're going to be uh, going to be looking at. Uh, so what I could then do is just go to the cash flow and do the pension calculations. But what that's not going to allow us to look at is the before and after picture. So, you know, what it looks like if he does make the contributions, what it looks like if he doesn't. So to enable us to do that, I'm going to set up a very quick what if scenario. Uh, and all that what if scenario is going to be is one scenario with the pension as it currently stands and one scenario with the pension with additional contributions. So I've just filtered my fact find here just to show personal pensions and I'm going to turn on the scenario view. So what the scenario view will show us is which scenarios each item features in. And you can see that Mike's personal pension here features in both our current position and a scenario here, which I've called additional contributions. So to change the name of a scenario, it's just the settings at the top here. Uh, and I've just changed the, the name of this scenario to additional contributions. Now, the main reason that I always recommend doing this uh, is because having scenarios called what if or having items called copy of Mike's personal pension, which is what I'm going to do right now, uh, is all well and good, uh, especially you know, if you've got the meeting with the client this week, next week, uh, it's, it's fine. Um, if the client postpones that meeting, if the client said to you, you know, we're going to have to push the meeting back by a month or three months or six months, uh, if you come back to this in six months time and you've got a pension called Mike's PPP copy and a scenario called what if and another one called scenario three and four and five, 
uh, it's going to make very little sense to you. Whereas if you give the, the items a meaningful description, uh, I find that it's much, much easier to come back to them in the future. So if we call this pension, uh, Mike PPP additional contributions. And the other thing we'll need to do is ensure that we only have one pension in each of our scenarios. So Mike's PPP here is currently featuring in both the current position and our additional contribution scenario. We don't want that to happen. We only want it to feature in the current position and then vice versa. So we're going to cross exclude these items. This pension with additional contributions should only feature in our scenario where we're looking at those additional contributions. So that's a very simple uh, illustration of how you'd set up a copy of an item with those cross exclusions. Uh, and of course, now we have uh, a pension that's unique to this scenario and we can change this in whatever way we see fit. So what I'm now going to do is use the cash flow tool to fix uh, the cash flow by looking at additional pension contributions. So again, you know, there's a host of different options we could have used for this client. The option we're going to go for is uh, in the pension toolbox here, the calculate maximum contributions option. And this will allow us to specify an existing pension and we can jump into it by clicking on these three dots here if we wanted to change the benefits uh, or if we wanted to change the fund value or just uh, amend the pension for any other reason. And then we can specify how we want these additional contributions to be made. So what year do we want to make the additional contributions? Do we want it to be a lump sum? Do we want it to be made in a specific tax year? Do we want it to be all tax years through to retirement? Do we want a custom date range? Who do we want to make the additional contributions? So the key difference that we'll see here is that personal contributions have a direct cost to the client. Employer contributions don't. Um, do we want to limit these contributions to the LTA threshold? So if additional contributions would hypothetically push a client over the lifetime allowance, we can choose to stop the contributions at that point. In this case, let's just have a look at the first option we looked at for Mike, which was a personal contribution this year. So again, uh, this will be the same figure that we just saw in the pension statement, £76,000. Uh, if he were to make a contribution of £76,000 this year, uh, there's going to be a direct cost to him. So his cash flow takes that initial hit uh, when he's making that contribution. And then we see a crossover point. So it's somewhere about here, uh, where his cash flow is actually better off. This black line here is with the additional contributions. And we can see that that's actually marginally better off all the way through, but it's not enough. It's nowhere near enough to achieve all of his lifestyle goals. So the second option we looked at was making regular contributions. So what if he were to make regular personal contributions to use up some of the available annual allowance each year through to retirement? So again, we can see uh, that carry forward being used over the next few years. And then he's just got the remaining annual allowance that he has each year after the existing contributions. So it's now what £3,612. Um, and we can see there that there's a massive short term cost to the client. So obviously those additional contributions cost him money. Uh, pension funds going to be higher at retirement um, and then the income that he gets from the pension. And again, I've used the sustainable income calculator in this case. So the advantage of that is that as we're making these additional contributions, the software is automatically recalculating that sustainable rate of income that he can take from the pension. Uh, and it does result in uh, the being better off from about age 70 uh, and actually having you know, liquidity through to about age 90 um, in their cash flow. The other option that I mentioned uh, a moment ago uh, is making these contributions uh, via the employer. So this would be the company making the contribution. Uh, yes, James, uh, what I've done is I've actually backdated his contributions for a few years. Um, obviously, we can only calculate carry forward if uh, if we've got those historic contributions. To do that, all you need to do will be to go into the pension and uh, specify the dates of the contributions. So we can go on to payment history here and you can see that I've actually backdated this to 2010. Uh, the contributions just to allow us to calculate the carry forward that's available. So yeah, so if we looked at uh, how much the employer could contribute this year, again, the employer isn't restricted to uh, the annual allowance, they're restricted to 100% of available carry forward, no direct cost to the client in the short term, uh, all we have is a bigger pension fund of retirement, which lasts them for longer. And again, we've got liquidity through to about age 90 here. The option that we opted for finally for this client was to make regular contributions through uh, to retirement uh, via the employer. 
Uh, and if you have a look at this, what we'll see is that the cash flow is you know, nice and healthy, having made these additional contributions, but it actually results in a slightly unrealistic first year. So in the first year here, we're assuming the employer makes a contribution of £145,000 and their company's worth probably twice that. So, uh, you know, the, co the company's not going to be making a contribution of £145,000 in the first year. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to choose to keep down at the bottom. And what we'll see is, uh, again, the advantage of working in a copy of the pension item rather than working in the client's actual current pension. So if we go back to the fact find and if we open up this PPP with the additional contributions, what we'll hopefully see is on the payment history tab, all of those additional contributions year by year have appeared on, uh, on the payment history. So we can see there that initial lump sum contribution and then the additional contributions that we're making each year. Uh, again, if we have a look at the benefits, what we'll see is the sustainable income option here has recalculated. So obviously incorporating those additional contributions, uh, it's recalculated to allow us to take a, a higher level of income from that point. But again, we have that, that, that year one contribution that's too high, that's unrealistic. Now, there's various different ways that we could, uh, we could uh, approach that. So obviously we could amend it uh, in the item so we could just change it from payment history. What I'm actually going to do today is use the fact find targeter. So the fact find targeter allows us to choose any inflow or outflow and the value that that would need to have to achieve a certain level of cash flow. Uh, so in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find that £145,000 contribution. Uh, and it's under outflows here, uh, although it is paid by the employer. We can see here uh, this little note here, uh, additional pension contribution paid by the employer. And we can choose what year we want to target for. And in this case, I'm going to choose the end of projection. And at the moment, their cash flow is currently sitting at about £185,000 that year. What would this contribution need to be to achieve a cash flow of £50,000 that year? And if I click on calculate, uh, so we will recalculate what that contribution will need to be to achieve a cash flow of £50,000 rather than £185,000 at age 100. And hopefully it's going to be a figure that's a bit more realistic, a bit more achievable than that 145k. Uh, so the contribution will need to be just short of £60,000. And again, we can see that their cash flow needs are met. So they're not running out of money. They're running down to £50,000, which is what I asked the tool to target there for me, just short of £50,000. And again, if we go back into the pension, what we'll see is that that contribution has been changed for us. Uh, so if we go to payment history, we can see that that unrealistic year one contribution has gone down to just under £60,000. And we can see that their cash flow is still looking you know, nice and healthy, having made that additional contribution. Um, if we jump to the pension statement, and again, uh, you know, it's a retirement planning webinar, we couldn't do so without looking uh, at the pension statement in quite a lot of depth. Uh, what we can see is that the majority of carry forward is being used. And actually this uh, this first chart here, looking at earnings and contributions is quite useful. Um, what we've got here is uh, a number of lines overlaid, but actually we can see uh, the personal contributions the client's making. So there's 3,600 pounds. We can see the employer contributions. Again, those are backdated uh, just to cover James's question uh, to 2010. Uh, we can see the employer contribution starting this year with that bigger lump sum and then the regular ongoing contributions. Uh, we can see the maximum additional contributions that they could be making. So obviously we're no longer using all £145,000. So we could be making some slight further additional contributions. And then we can overlay on the top of that the annual allowance um, and then their pensionable earnings as well. Um, if we have a look at the annual allowance statement now behind the scenes, what you'll see is that there's no unused allowance in, in future years. So obviously, you know, they need to use it in the next three years if they want to use it. From that point onwards, they're actually using all £40,000. So we can see that we're now making good use of, of the available carry forward. We can also see if we have a look at the net worth, uh, the impact of that sustainable uh, income option that I've chosen in the pension items. So we can see you know, the pension fund grows nicely through to retirement. They're releasing tax free cash. But actually, you know, even having added those additional contributions, the software is still doing that sustainable income calculation to allow us to, to use up all of that pension wealth through to age 100. And of course, we have a look at the client's cash flow. You know, we're now in a position where if we compare that back to their current position, um, you know, having made those additional contributions, we can now see that you know, everything's now OK. Um, Lovely. So hopefully that's given you all a brief insight into uh, some of the more advanced pension planning 
options within Truth. Uh, it's hopefully given you a brief insight into you know, how the annual allowance and the lifetime allowance mechanics of the software work, how we look at things like fixed protection, uh, how we look at different uh, lifetime allowance scenarios, how we look at uh, additional contributions, maximizing uh, the use of the client's annual allowance. Um, I'm going to jump on to any questions. I will leave my screen share open because I think we may need uh, may need to see my screen to, to, to answer some of these questions. I'm just going to go back to uh, some of the earlier questions in the chat and hopefully we can uh, we can address some of these as we as we go through. Um, so, uh, David. Uh, so rental income from property uh, within a SIP, uh, what we show is we'd effectively show money uh, money going into the pension without the client making those contributions. So there's two different ways of modelling this. Uh, the first one is to show transfers in uh, via payment history. Uh, the second one is to assume uh, that the growth rate in the pension incorporates uh, the um, the income that's coming in from the property. So we could adjust, obviously, gross up the uh, the growth rate on the pension to incorporate that. Uh, so there's the easiest ways. Um, as with, you know, and I'll mention this with, with all of the questions that we cover um, this morning. Uh, if you do want to look at this in any more detail, the best thing to do is always to, to, to give us a call on support and we can look at a specific client case with you and look at how we'd model it for that client case. It makes much more sense when we're looking at it uh, with a real live client than it does, you know, talking about it in the, in the hypothetical. Uh, James, uh, is the tax-free cash dumped into a bank account or assumed to have been invested somewhere? Now, the tax-free cash, uh, you can specify that it's invested. So we could put, for example, uh, a contribution into uh, a policy uh, or an investment uh, that happens on that retirement key date. Um, what happens by default is that it goes into the surplus account. So unless we specify that it goes somewhere, the software deems it to be invested with other surplus capital uh, where it's getting a net return of whatever we specify in settings here. So in this case, it's going into the surplus account and it's growing at 4%. We could equally, as I say, we could put in a contribution tied to that same retirement key date into the client's unit trust portfolio or their ISA or wherever we wanted that money to go. Uh, and you know, lifetime allowance charge on inherited pension fund, is that calculated by truth? If not, how best to show that? No, we don't currently calculate, uh, we don't, don't currently show that the LTA charge on inherited pension funds. So uh, you can specify an inherited pension fund. Uh, the way you do that, uh, so for example, if the client had uh, an inherited flex access drawdown fund, uh, you can enter a drawdown fund and you can tick the tax-free dependence policy at the top, assuming that the, uh, the deceased died before age 75. Um, you can do the same in the annuity item. So we do have uh, in the annuity items, we also have a tax-free dependence option there, um, tax-free dependence annuity down the bottom there. If you wanted to factor these into the lifetime allowance calculation, what you can do is you can manually input any historic lifetime allowance events. And this is the same if you had a client who had historically uh, I don't know, crystallized a £50,000 pension pot a few years ago, you can manually input further transactions onto this screen, uh, which can use a portion of the client's lifetime allowance. So if we said, for example, that a year ago, um, £200,000 worth of lifetime allowance were used by uh, inherited pension. Never remember which BC number it is. Uh, but if we pop that in, what you'll see is that the software incorporates that and the applicable LTA at that point into the lifetime allowance calculation moving forwards. Uh, Andrew, I think the, the, the best thing to do would be uh, give the support team a call. We'll log in, we'll have a look at the specifics of your case and we'll have a look at the best way of... Uh, best way of modeling it there. But yes, so fundamentally, uh, what you'll be looking at doing there is is, is inputting a manual uh, contribution there um, on the crystallization screen. I'm just gonna stop screen share and jump back over. Apologies, I've been looking over to the side at you all. Uh, you've all been on my, uh, on my side screen there. Uh, so you're now back front and center. So uh, yeah, hopefully that's been uh, a useful uh, useful morning for everyone. Hopefully we've covered uh, the vast majority of your questions. Uh, we've looked uh, in quite a lot of depth at uh, the different mechanics for the software in terms of uh, retirement planning options, uh, in terms of lifetime allowance, in terms of annual allowance, uh, and uh, yeah, 
so thank you all very much for joining us today uh, we're hoping to run some further similar webinars over the next few months and weeks uh, if there's anything in particular you'd like us to cover in future webinars please please do let us know uh, in the feedback so uh, you know if there's specific topics that you'd like us to cover uh, one thing that we uh, we looked at in some of our user groups recently was things like lifetime mortgages which i know many of you will probably be having marketed to you these days uh, if there's anything you'd like us to cover in future webinars please do let us know uh, we're always keen to ensure that the content that we're delivering for you db pensions david i'll jump straight on that um yes nick there will be a recording um so everyone should receive uh, an automated email with a link to a recording of the session uh, later this morning if you don't get that please do let me know and i can manually share a link to the recording we may also be putting it on our youtube channel depending on whether we choose to uh, repeat the session as well so apologies for the technical issues at the start uh, thank you all very much for joining us today uh, enjoy the rest of your day lifetime mortgages equity release pensions fantastic i'll get straight on that james thanks everyone i'll see you all soon